Welcome to ServiceNet Spotlight, where we will be talking about the people and programs of this multifaceted agency. I'm Amy Swisher. I'm the Vice President of Community Relations for ServiceNet. And our tagline is Innovative Mental Health and Human Services, with innovative being the operative word there. Today we're going to focus on the innovation engine that has driven ServiceNet from the start. Our guest today is Sue Stubbs, who is President and CEO of ServiceNet and she has led the organization for more than 30 years. So we're going to do a little bit of traveling back in time and then bringing you up to the present. So let's first travel back to 1980, which mm -hmm. is when you came to what was not yet ServiceNet, but was the agency mm -hmm. that would become ServiceNet. And if you would describe the climate at that time, what was going on and what was your role in it? Mm -hmm. Well, the state hospital had just started downsizing. It was a couple of years prior to then that the consent decree, which was a class action court case, happened. And that was a uh, class action suit that uh, was filed by some family members of people that were uh, patients at Northampton State Hospital, which was a huge psychiatric institution at the time. And um, they sued the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the basis of the lawsuit was that um, many of the people that were there um, really didn't uh, want to be there. And they mm -hmm. were there against their will. And the court, the federal court, um, deemed that people really had the right to be treated in the least restrictive setting that would be appropriate for them. And for many of those people, and they called themselves inmates at the time, or mm. the advocates wow. did. Um, Many of, for many of them, um, they were not in any way dangerous and didn't really have to be institutionalized. And so over the next several years, there was a plan whereby the hospital was downsizing its population and eventually closing its doors forever. And how many people were there At roughly? its heyday, yeah. I don't know the exact number, but I understand it was in the thousands, maybe a few thousand. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the time I remember being, uh, when I, by the time I got there, which was, as I said, a couple of years after the consent decree, they'd already started to downsize, and there were about, I, if I remember right, about 500 or so. Mm -hmm. And then over the next few years, um, there was a, the court mandated that a certain number of people were supposed to be transferred to community-based programs. So the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which that was actually required to allocate a certain amount of money every year to create uh, community-based alternatives for the people that had been living in the state hospital. So, meaning, meaning group homes? Group homes okay. and a, a variety of other services. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't enough just to provide uh, places for people to live, but they also needed clinical services, mm -hmm. outpatient services, and in some cases, day treatment where they could go during the day and, and receive treatment. Um, so actually, our uh, founders of the organization that eventually became ServiceNet, they were advocates who had been involved in the whole movement um, that ended in the, the closing of the state hospital. And they were just an advocacy organization, but as the situation evolved and there were monies being allocated for community-based services, um, they were approached and asked if they would uh, open some group homes and um, some other organizations formed to provide the clinical services. So our roots were really in the residential side, um, specifically group homes for people that were leaving Northampton State Hospital. And so then you arrive in 1980, as mm -hmm. you say, a couple of years after the decree. And um, how many people comprised the organization at that time? Our and, organization? And how many group homes, yes. Yeah, well, when I got there, um, there were three group homes. One of them was large. Uh, we don't have group homes this large. We learned a lot by sort of trial and error back mm -hmm. in the day. And uh, one of our homes was uh, for 12 people, which arguably was sort of a mini institution. And sure. we kind of learned that that wasn't the most, uh, that wasn't conducive to really being in the community because it was a mini institution. So we gradually, we closed, actually, there was a bad story that actually burned to the ground, but we didn't rebuild it. Instead, we moved those people into, uh, thankfully no one was hurt, mm -hmm. and we moved those people into uh, smaller group homes. And now our group mm -hmm. homes are, have a maximum of five people. So like a family. So it's, they're like Four family to five homes. People. Sure. So our original mission was um, to provide group homes for people with serious mm -hmm. mental illness, mm -hmm. um, initially people who had been in the state hospital, and then it broadened um, over the years to, uh, well, that's 
part of the story that we're going to talk about, but even within this population of people with serious mental illness, it's morphed into being more of a preventive because we don't have we don't believe in institutionalizing people with serious mental illness at least not long term the way it happened back then. So um, a lot of people are not leaving an institution, but rather um, are in a group home instead of an institution as an alternative. And many of those people also, as we've learned over the years, can um, can live in uh, settings that are actually less restrictive even than a group home. Specifically, they can live on their own, either with roommates or with, with their own families, and receive outreach services or support services. So it's, um, it's changed an it's enormous changed amount. A lot. Yeah. But you had a so so, and and, and there's a story you you often tell you always tell at at our orientation, where um, there was some another call that came. So we started out with people coming out of the state hospital, mm -hmm. and then you had a call from what was then the Department of Mental Retardation, since re, since renamed Department of Developmental Services. Yes. And um, what happened? Well, for for several years actually, after um, we were founded. Um, our mission remained um, providing services to people with serious mental illness, but we broadened it to uh, go beyond group homes, and we eventually merged with another organization that had outpatient services and day treatment services, so we had everything under one roof. Mm -hmm. But um, along the way, um, we were approached by the state, as you, as you said, Department of uh, Mental Retardation, which has since changed its name, um, to ask us if we would serve uh, a person who was developmentally disabled, which we also call intellectual disability, mm -hmm. and also had a mental health challenge. And she had been, um, she had engaged in several very dysfunctional behaviors that had gotten her locked up in both institutions and jail. Uh, specifically, she had set some fires and she had been acting out violently against some of the people that were taking care of her. Um, and so the Department of Mental Retardation um, had kind of run out of options for her. They, uh, there were several organizations at the time, and, and some of them still exist today, that specialize in services to people with intellectual disabilities. And back at, at that time, a lot of the, uh, most of the agencies didn't have clinical expertise. They didn't, they weren't really equipped to deal with behavioral or mental health challenges. And, as we now know and accept, and it's widely accepted, that many of the people that have intellectual disability also have mental health challenges. And now um, those agencies that specialize in that work also have clinici clinicians on staff, and they can deal with uh, behavioral issues. But then it wasn't so much the case. So they had run out of options, and the organizations that had had her in their support programs or group homes had um, one by one kind of refused to take her back for, uh, for good reason because they really couldn't, they weren't equipped to deal with her, her behaviors. And uh, so in desperation, they called out, they uh, reached out to ServiceNet and, uh, f to see whether we would be able to uh, take her into one of our group homes or actually what they were asking was for us to create a group home for one. I know that sounds like an oxymoron. <laughs> a special <laughs> but, home. Yeah. But they yeah. But it actually, it really was uh, in their minds a group home because what they hoped was that if we could deal with this woman, her, a young woman, her name was Lillian, mm -hmm. and when we met her, we were surprised. She was only, she was under five. She was like four foot ten, mm -hmm. small person, and looked very unassuming. And it was remarkable mm -hmm. how much chaos she had <laughs> caused and mm -hmm. and uh, through her behaviors. But um, their hope was that if we could manage her and treat her successfully in the group home that others could move in as well. And they also had their eye on some other individuals that had been, um, that had behavioral issues, maybe not as severe as what Lillian was going through, but other people that might benefit from uh, more clinic, a more clinical approach than was available in the uh, organization specializing in DD work. And you had done, um, Ed, there had been a group of people who had gone after specific training um, in, in, a, in a model to, to work with. Yeah. Lillian. Yes, um, we um, we didn't just automatically say yes. We we did some thinking about it, and we knew it would represent um, a sort of um, uh, d departure from our original mission, which was to serve people with mental health challenges. Although she did have mental health challenges, um, but at the time, our clinical director was uh, a man, a psychologist, who had actually worked at Munson um, Academy, which was a, a program a an institution for people with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. And he was trained in applied behavior analysis, 
which is a methodology for um, dealing with behavior, behavioral issues. And it's specifically very successful in working with people who also have intellectual disabilities. And now all of the agencies that do provide group, home and other, group homes and other support programs for that population usually have people that can, that can implement that, um, those interventions. But back then, uh, not so much. So. And so Lillian came, she and, came. She, and she lived, Long story out, short. Lived, lived out her life with us. Yes, right? and we, um, yeah, we, we hired a staff, and our uh, clinical director, Steve, he trained people, and, um, and they were prepared to, to uh, work with her. And except for the first day, uh, she, she went back to a hospital once for a very brief hospitalization. Mm -hmm. But, um, and the first, I think it was the first day or the first week, during the first few days that she was there, she did um, somehow get away from staff and got out near the street and she was throwing rocks at passing cars. Mm. Um, luckily not hitting, she didn't hit anyone. But um, quickly her, uh, her symptoms really um, changed and she really did respond to the treatment. She never really had the benefit of that treatment before. And she was doing so well that they did, in fact, place other people in the home with her. And uh, she lived with us at ServiceNet for about 10 years. Unfortunately, she developed cancer at a quite a young age, and, mm -hmm. and she died in our home. But if you think about how different her life would have been had we not said yes, um, she could have died alone in an institution or even in jail. Uh, and instead, she was surrounded by people who really cared about her. And she had roommates that she had developed friendships, relationships with. and. She had a, behind all of this violent behavior was a really good sense of humor and she kept people um, smiling and laughing even up until the day she died, so. Well, and a person whose potential was realized. Yeah. In, yeah. in a way that it could not have been otherwise. Yeah. I, that, that story always gets to <laughs> me. I, I, I love it. Group homes aren't group homes, group homes are homes. You can see when you walk into a ServiceNet group home, it's a home. The furnishings are the furnishings you'd have in your own home. And we pay real close attention to details. I got, great, I got a great team of staff that take care of me. The people that live in the homes are treated like anybody else. Sometimes it's, you know, I walk into the house, I need to talk to you. It's, it feels good that I can satisfy whatever that, that is that they need to talk about. Very good staff here. Everybody here makes it feel like home, because they're awesome. So, so what impact did that decision to say yes to Lillian mm -hmm. when others had said no, what impact has that had on the agency, not just then, but over time? Well, that particular decision actually had a huge impact, because um, what happened as I mentioned, we other people moved into the home with Lillian, and the Department of Mental Retardation saw how this transformed the lives of the people who moved in, who hadn't done well in other group homes. So um, over time, they took a look at many of the people who were living in group homes who were not thriving, who had behaviors that really maybe hadn't been treated, and they uh, asked us to open more group homes and um, during those years we opened three or four new group homes every year taking in people who had maybe not done as well elsewhere and who had, because of behavioral issues because of basically mental health challenges so we grew rapidly and, to, and it's continued to today now our growth has been more uh, in the area of brain injury services we have opened a number of group homes for people with brain injuries and that was an, that's another long story that has to do with another actually two lawsuits that guaranteed um, treat, uh, residential treatment for people with brain injuries who were um, un, really placed in, in nursing homes that really were not appropriate, were inappropriate placements it's for the them. Same kind of philosophy same of, kind of philosophy. less is more. Yeah, that people mm -hmm. deserve to be in the least restrictive mm -hmm. setting for their particular mm -hmm. challenges. So we've continued to grow, and actually that part of our organization that provides group homes and outreach services for people with brain injuries and developmental disabilities is almost half of our organization at this point. And when I think back to the fact that it wasn't even part of our original mission, um, it's quite remarkable. So it had a, a lasting impact, not only on the agency and it's how it looks today, but on the lives of it, all those people who are 
thriving uh, under our care. Well, so, so let's talk about this, because this is, there, there's a philosophical piece here about saying yes when others may have said no, about leaping into territory that we is unfamiliar to us, but mm -hmm. we know we can learn. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is pretty pervasive throughout. And, and I said yeah. the innovation engine has been driving ServiceNet, and mm -hmm. it's, it's that, yeah, let's say, let's try it. Let's go find what we need to learn to, mm -hmm. um, to take it to the next step. Talk about how that's continued over time, well, in general, yeah, throughout the agency. Um, it's, um, the, the word entrepreneur or entrepreneurship is uh, not often um, used in describing a nonprofit. And I actually used to think that um, all nonprofits kind of had the same culture because we're all in this work kind of for the same reasons. We, we uh, want to make a difference. And when people, new people come in and we have orientation and we go around the table and people mention or talk about why they were attracted to come to work at ServiceNet, many of them say they want to work in a nonprofit. They want to mm -hmm. work with people. They want to make a difference. And our grandiosity, we want to change the world. Sure. Um, <laughs> But what I've come to learn over the years is that uh, not all nonprofits are created the same or create themselves the same because it is a constant um, creating of ourselves, really. Uh, and we have a culture, for better or worse, of um, risk take, being willingness to take a risk, um, um, wanting, to, um, wanting to jump in or step in where people need us and there isn't a service. Uh, so we've branched in many different directions over the years. Uh, we got into um, providing shelter and housing services because mm -hmm. there was a, a need in Western Mass and that came to light through some advocacy similar to the advocacy that came ab that our founders actually were part of um, on behalf of the people in Northampton State Hospital. But there were there used to be a belief that homeless people only existed in large cities like Springfield and Boston, mm -hmm. and that we didn't really have that problem here in the in the Pioneer, upper Pioneer Valley. But um, there were, and unfortunately still are, some people living in cars, living camping by the river and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, we were asked to step to the plate and, and um, open some homeless shelters when the money was allocated as a result of some advocacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, we had a... Uh, we had to to think about our mission and whether we wanted to broaden it, and uh, again, we decided to say yes. In that instance, we initially thought that we would um, be willing to open some shelters and then uh, we might spin it off as a separate organization. But back during those years, um, there was a trend towards mergers and, and consolidation as opposed to s agencies separating out. And besides, once we got... Um, into the uh, business of providing services to people who are homeless. We got very attached to it, and we discovered that there wasn't that much of a difference between that population and some of the other people. Well, and there's so much overlap, too, when you think yeah. of what we're doing with, like you said, with developmental disabilities, overlapping with mental health issues, programs for folks who are homeless, sometimes overlapping with mental health or with addiction issues, mm -hmm. which is another one of our services. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, yeah, this constant saying yes, and, and not randomly, but what makes sense for us mm -hmm. and what relates to the skill sets that people have, mm -hmm. and then what skill sets could we learn. Yeah, and these days, having gotten much larger, we have to be careful. We have to watch out for the whole, and we have to make sure that we're, we're um, financially, fiscally responsible. So we do do a business plan whenever there's a, an opportunity that comes across our radar screen or an, a state agency that asks us to open a new kind of program. We don't just say yes to absolutely everything <laughs> randomly because that would not be um, prudent for us as an organization. Mm -hmm. But um, And there's not overlap all the time. I mean, uh, not everyone who's homeless has a mental health or addiction problem. There are a lot of people who just have bad luck and um, medical issues and so on in this country where, uh, at least in Massachusetts, that's not so much true anymore. But back when we started, there were still there were still a lot of people that didn't have health insurance. Sure. And even today, um, people's insurance don't cover sometimes catastrophic medical mm -hmm. events. So there's lots of reasons why people become homeless. But even if they didn't have a behavioral health or mental health challenge prior, being homeless itself is pretty stressful and they can sometimes use mental health counseling. And <laughs> we have another area that I wanted to get into as we think about this culture of 
um, going where others have not yet gone. Um, and that has to do with something that happened in 2010. In 2010, um, there was a llama, I believe, <laughs> that was donated to one of our group homes Two for people. Two llamas. Two llamas. A boy and a girl. A boy and a girl. <laughs> and, 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 and there have been more since, but um, to a, a group home for people with mental illness. Mm -hmm. And um, that led to something rather much larger and, and, and really interesting. So let's talk about mm -hmm. the evolution of what has become ServiceNet's Prospect Meadow Farm. Okay. Well, um, we had a group home, we still do, in Williamsburg um, that had quite a bit of land and it just happened that um, one of the staff had had chickens in her youth and she was interested in, and s some of the clients living there were also interested in uh, gardening and animals and so on. So they were growing some things in the backyard and they had a couple of chickens. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the other staff that worked there happened to be friends with the Omasta family, who is a local family that raises llamas. And somehow there was an offer of a donation of two llamas to the group home in Williamsburg. And when they asked me about it, my first reaction was, mm, what? <laughs> 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 I couldn't quite envision how we would accommodate or take care of these llamas. They're pretty large animals. And I was a bit of a skeptic, I have to admit, even in my uh, sort of risk-taking entrepreneurial <laughs> self. <laughs> so. But um, they convinced me it would be a good idea. And our maintenance crew um, came and uh, made a fence around part of the yard and they built a little uh, shelter lean-to thing out of wood in the yard and uh, the llamas arrived. And what we discovered was that um, having these animals and the other animals, we'd also noticed also just from the, having the chickens and growing things that it was very therapeutic to the folks living in the home who had mental health challenges. And in fact, one young woman who was living in that program um, had not been able to engage in therapy at all. She'd been in therapy with different uh, therapists and she really wasn't able to talk about her issues or problems. And the staff um, started to notice that she was confiding in the girl llama. She'd go outside and- The girl llama. The girl, mm -hmm. yeah, she bonded with the, the, the girl. So she was talking about her problems and issues, and that woman had been pretty suicidal. And um, the staff started to notice that her mm -hmm. suicidal gestures had decreased. So it was pretty, I mean, it's kind of a, a no-brainer when you think about it, that animals, I mean, we all know that the, we've all heard mm -hmm. of therapy dogs, and, mm -hmm. and uh, being outdoors in the sunshine is healthy, and growing things can be therapeutic for anybody, gardening. So um, we started to think seriously about this phenomenon and uh, decided that we had to have a farm. The vocational programs at ServiceNet assist people in finding meaningful jobs and really trying to experience everyday activity. There's much more to work than just a paycheck. It's the value of work itself, doing something meaningful, making a contribution. When people come to us, it may well be the first work experience they've ever had. At Prospect Meadow Farm, we offer a supported employment program, and that's for folks with developmental disabilities. We grow vegetables on four acres of our 11 and a half acre property. We also uh, have over 1,500 shiitake mushroom logs. We do landscaping, full service landscaping. Uh, we also have a small catering company. So one day they might be caring for animals or they might be at a conference center providing lunch to dozens of people. The best thing for Justin was that going to Prospect Meadow Farm gave him an identity. He just feels really fulfilled at the end of the day. You know, on a farm you can see things from the beginning to the end. And I think that means a lot for the folks that we serve. I learned how to be an, a leader, an innovator. You get to meet new people and interact with them. What I learned about this place is be responsible for your job. Our vocational services cover Franklin, Hampshire, and Berkshire counties. We tailor our services to the needs of the individuals that come to us. We start out by training them, and then we place them in jobs. We helped Lisa find a job at Berkshire Community College over eight years ago. Lisa's the first person that I've worked with from your service net, and it's been a wonderful experience. She's taken a complete ownership of the dish in the dish area. Without her, it kind of all starts to just roll downhill. 
I love watching her inspire other people to work harder. I feel good about my job. I love my friends too. Without work, many of our folks would really struggle to find social connections. What's great about a work program like ours is that they get to build connections that can last. I feel, I feel great about myself. To make me happy, you. To like my family, you. You're able to see that when you care about something and you take care of it, it grows. And we try to get our folks to understand that their life is the same way. That if they take care of themselves and they work hard, they're going to continue to grow. And growth is what we see every day in the people that we serve. And one of the things that's since happened, because that began as a the llamas and the chickens were, were at, a, at a home where people were living who had mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And then the farm has since evolved into a vocational services mm -hmm. training program um, for actually employment site for people um, who have developmental disabilities and autism. Um, so really has changed and morphed. Mm -hmm. And was that, how did that happen? The That's an example of when um, best laid plans or business plans uh, make no sense because <laughs> we had a b we had an idea and the idea was to take this contract that we had from the state department of mental health uh, that would support the farm and we had the idea that we would also have p some many people because it was a big project would come during the day and work on it and um, we had had some um, some tentative interest expressed by the department of mental health and uh, they maybe thought that they could help fund it, but they weren't really able to because funding cuts came, uh, the, the bad part of the recession. Uh, mm -hmm. So there wasn't really any funding for that. So um, we weren't about to sell the farm. We were pretty committed to it and it was working well in its uh, infancy, even without, even with just the people living there who uh, moved from the group home in Williamsburg and a few other people that had started coming there during the day uh, without real funding attached to them. So we did lose a little bit of money in the early days, but, um, but we came up with the idea to approach the Department of Mental, I think by then it was called the Department of Developmental Services, what used to be Department of Mental Retardation. And they were very interested. They had vocational money. And they, um, as it turned out, there were many of the individuals that they were supporting in vocational programs who were not so happy with whatever the vocational activity was that they were doing mm -hmm. and they were looking for alternatives so um, when we um, showed them we took them on tours of the farm um, they got pretty excited and over the next few years actually uh, sent us a lot of people who came with money that helped support the project so today we have uh, over 70 people that are involved um, full-time or part-time going to the farm. And it's just such an amazing place to visit <laughs> and, and as I have done several times. And we'll, we'll talk more about the farm in future programs um, because mm -hmm. I know we have a lot of stories there, but it's r remarkable from a, a couple of folks that are a few people at the at group home in Williamsburg, now a program that serves 70 plus mm -hmm. and where they had a few chickens, <laughs> they now have more than a thousand. Yes. And where they grew a few vegetables, they now have, I think it's 3,000 to 5,000 shiitake mushroom logs. Yeah, um, so that's another story too. But uh, the, the shiitake <laughs> mushroom story is pretty dramatic. Um, but, but what another example of saying yes, saying we'll figure it out. <laughs> and as you say, sometimes be the best laid plans just go in a whole other direction. Mm -hmm. But if we've got the open spirit to follow mm -hmm. that direction, mm -hmm. some pretty magnificent things can happen. Yeah, we, we have a sort of culture of thinking positively and being good problem solvers. So when things don't exactly go the way we planned, um, we just um, come up with a new plan. <laughs> come up with a new plan, we grow some more, we learn some more. And grow and some mushrooms. And grow some <laughs> mushrooms and good things happen. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sue, so much for talking with us today and covering, covering some ground to get the philosophy of ServiceNet <laughs> illustrated in story. Really appreciate it. Well, my pleasure. Great.